motion to accept the agenda is printed. Please. Um, all, favor. all in favor? Carry. Uh, declaration of pecuniary interest, if any. None noted. Okay, uh, we need a motion for approval of the minutes of the regular meeting, June 1st. Jane? Uh, I just said something. It's fine. You said you got James. I got uh, your second? Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, any discussion on that? Sure. Okay, all red, right? Okay, all in favor? Carried. Uh, deputations uh, or invited guests. Uh, number one on the list is uh, Bill Baird, the uh, general manager, uh, and uh, Jane Thompson, communications coordinator for Maitland Valley. And I guess it's explaining the thing that we had a copy of the work plan so that however you want to proceed with it. Uh, where did we turn the project? Turn the lights. Oh, that's great. Pretty early in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just while they're doing that, uh, reevince and announce the council. Thank you for permitting us to uh, address council this evening. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing Jane Thompson, she's our communications coordinator and she'll be assisting me with the presentation. Uh, the purpose tonight is to outline the restructuring uh, that Snake Valley is undergoing with its services over the next three years, and outline some of the changes that we're taking uh, this year uh, towards in support of that work plan. So our presentation will expand upon the summary that you got uh, in your package. So we'd appreciate getting any feedback uh, from you on the changes that we're making to our, uh, our services. So I'm going to cover three parts of the, there's going to be three parts of this presentation, uh, through some background, your service area priorities, and some of the financial challenges that we're working through. Um, please feel free to ask us any questions as we move through this presentation. So just a little bit of background, uh, Maitland Valley is owned governed and primarily financed by the 15 municipalities located in the Maitland and the Nine Mile watershed. So we cover parts of four counties, all the way over across almost to Arthur, down to Gilberton, and across and across to South of Goddard. So we're one of 36 conservation authorities established by the province at the request of municipalities back in the 1950s. Municipalities wanted a way to work on issues such as flooding and water quality. Um, in our rivers and lakes, and these are issues that are best worked out on a watershed basis because they go beyond municipal boundaries. So when I spoke to council last year, um, Maitland Valley had not completed its uh, restructuring plans. Uh, we are now in year two of a multi-year effort to restructure our services. The focus of our restructuring is to do a few important things really well. Uh, we can no longer afford to try and do the wide range of services uh, that we've traditionally undertaken or to maintain and operate all the infrastructure and equipment uh, uh, that we have. I think these are similar challenges to what municipalities face. So the focus of our restructuring is to strengthen our services related to flood and erosion safety and watershed stewardship. So I'll now turn the presentation over to Jane Thompson to outline the, uh, the ways that we're trying to strengthen those uh, two services. So with regards to flood and erosion and safety services, there are three things that the authority has kind of focused on, three key things that we feel we need to do very well. And the first of that is flood forecasting. So we have several thousand residents that either live or work or both in a flood prone area. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, and these areas have an assessment value of about $176 million. And that's spread over 15 communities. So we need to maintain a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week flood forecasting network so that we can provide flood advice to our member municipalities as well as our, our first responders. So right now, our network consists of 16 gauging stations and 32 precipitation state, uh, gauges that are sort of strategically placed across the watershed. And just to explain what this map is showing, the black circles that you're seeing represent urban areas that have a significant flood risk. The large circle, or oval, I guess, along the shoreline, you know, represents a, a really significant erosion-prone area. And the red uh, blotches that you see are more of our rural floodplain um, uh, areas or, or flood-prone areas. So um, I mentioned already that we have the 32 uh, precipitation gauges and um, many of those are new, or quite a few of those are new, both in the headwaters areas of, um, uh, of the uh, North Maitland River as well as in the Middle Maitland River. And I think it's important to remember that in North Huron, those gauges will benefit you in terms of improving our ability for flood forecasting because you know Wingham certainly is a, a community at risk. We are, we are seeing changes in our local climate in terms of you know, we have a higher probability of these intense thunderstorms that can produce a tremendous amount of rain in a short period of time. This is just a screenshot from the radar back in 2005 when a storm cell stalled over the community of Molesworth. And that community received 200 millimeters of rain in just a couple of hours. More recently, last year, Molesworth got hit again received 71 millimeters of rain in just over an hour. And last Monday, uh, the area around Seaport received 110 millimeters of rain over a 14 or 15 hour period. So the kind of flood forecasting that we're doing has really changed. It's no longer focused on that typical spring flood. We need to be able to react much more quickly than, than we did in the past. And these kinds of intense rain um, storms certainly can have an impact on municipal infrastructure. So it places your culverts and bridges and municipal drains at, at higher risk. One of the things that we've done to address this issue is in 2014, we added a new position, our water resources technician. And that position is really helping to ensure that we're able to provide flood forecasting for 365 days a year. The second element that we're really focused on in flood and erosion safety services is ensuring that we can support our municipalities, ensuring that they're well prepared to handle or respond to a flood or erosion emergency. And so we're working with staff in terms of staff training, um, we're providing um, flood exercises, flood emergency exercises, uh, as well as encouraging our municipalities to have uh, a good practical uh, flood emergency response um, plan. It's important to remember that in the Maitland watershed, we may only have a few hours to respond to a flood event. So all of that planning needs to be done well in advance, and we really need to be prepared ahead of time. North Huron participated in a flood emergency exercise in 2014, and I just wanted to mention that our staff are certainly interested and enthusiastic about following up from that exercise. So certainly thinking about in terms of developing flood progression mapping for North Huron, um, reviewing your flood emergency plan if you're interested, and assisting with future flood exercises. So just switching to the shoreline for a moment, we have a 50 kilometer uh, shoreline, uh, section of shoreline within our jurisdiction. And in that area, you know, it's, it's highly erodible bluffs in, in that area. So it encompasses about $366 million worth of land and development that are located within that 100 year erosion line. So I'm not sure if you can see very well, but the red line on the map, you know, anything to the west of that, that represents our 100 year erosion line. But it's not just the block erosion we're worried about. We have significant concerns about gully erosion as well. So those areas in between the yellow lines are areas susceptible to gully erosion. That shows the 100-year gully erosion line. So within there, we have about 2,000 acres of land uh, and another $90 million worth of development at risk from, from gully erosion. 
Um, and I should just mention that most of that development occurred prior to there being uh, planning for stormwater management requirements in that area. So finally, with regards to flood and erosion safety services, the third thing we want to be able to do is provide really strong technical support and floodplain information to assist our municipalities to make really good decisions with respect to land use planning and development in areas that are susceptible to flooding and erosion. So we need to be providing up-to-date floodplain mapping, and that's mapping that's done to standards that reflect our changing climate trends. I want, also wanted to mention just briefly that the Conservation Authority is currently proposing amendments to our floodplain mapping. There will be a public information center held on July the 7th uh, uh, for the Huron County portion of those um, amendments to the floodplain maps, and it'll be held at the community center in Brussels. There'll be more information about that on our, on our website. <coughs> Phil mentioned already the, the real strong focus on watershed stewardship services. That we see that as a, a, an important key area for us in terms of supporting landowners who are interested in undertaking soil and water conservation projects. So the focus is to help landowners identify conservation systems um, that will help them to keep soil and nutrients on the land and out of the water courses. Um, and so why is that important? Well, Maitland and Tanaima watersheds We've got about 470,000 acres of pine and cultural land that's valued at just under $4.7 billion. So keeping that soil and nutrients on the land is, is really important. So within stewardship services, there are four key elements that we're looking at. And the first is rural stormwater management. The second is soil health. The third is soil and water conservation. And the fourth is the reforestation of marginal lands and the planting of buffer strips and windbreaks and, and snow fences. You, you've probably seen a lot of water in the field over the last week. Uh, and this was a shot just along Highway 86, um, just uh, west of Molesworth. So the development of, of uh, rural stormwater management systems, again, is key to that idea of keeping the soil and nutrients on the land. So these systems help to slow that stormwater down, spread it out, and give it a chance to soak in. Um, this it, rural stormwater management is an approach that municipalities can consider um, that they can be incorporated into municipal drainage projects uh, where it's appropriate to do so. So we want to have the expertise to help both municipalities and landowners um, undertake these systems again where they're appropriate. So rural stormwater management also certainly helped to prevent this kind of situation. So in terms of damage again to infrastructure such as, such as roads and culverts. We also want to work with municipalities and landowners um, in terms of planting trees to buffer our water courses, to create wind breaks, and to create living snow fences as well. We've estimated that we've got about 50,000 acres of land in the watersheds uh, still under agricultural production. So there's a lot of potential there for reforestation projects. We have really changed our approach to the way that we do our reforestation services. So the Conservation Authority is no longer in the field planting trees. Instead, we have contractors that are doing that planting work for us and in partnership with us. And that's a way to free up our staff time so that we can be working more directly with landowners to let them know about our projects, to do things like survival assessments, site planning, uh, and to try to connect landowners with grant opportunities as well. Um, just to give you some numbers, uh, this year because we've just finished our spring tree planting uh, session and our landowners and municipalities planted 41,287 trees. And then in addition, the Conservation Authority, we planted another 8,000 trees. And that's part of our efforts to plant down some marginal land that we have on our own, on our own properties. So in total, just under 50,000 <coughs> trees. In comparison to 2014, in 2014 we planted 21,800 trees. So a really significant jump over, over the past year. So uh, I, th I suspect that most of you, if not all of you, are quite familiar with the Huron Clean Water Project that provides grants to landowners undertaking projects that will help to protect um, uh, 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 water quality. Um, and we've been doing the Huron Clean Water Project for uh, about 10 years now, along with a program in Wellington County, 
and a project, a program that seems to come and go in Perth County, a very small program that's not, not currently being, being offered. But over the last 10 years, we have done on average about 140 projects a year. You can see that over $1.7 million in grants allocated, total value of those projects over $7.2 million. If we look specifically at North Huron, <coughs> we've had 83 projects completed in this municipality, almost $100,000 in grants, and almost $470,000 in terms of the, the total grant, grant value. So we're seeing increasing demand for these projects, and we want to listen to what our landowners are telling us in terms of evaluating the, the, the program. So this year we have added two new categories to the program, um, and one is specifically for the shoreline. So there are now grants available for composting toilets, and the other new category is for cover crops. So landowners can get a grant for up to two, up to 200 acres of land uh, if it's um, put into cover crops. <coughs> and again, we just we were really focused on trying to increase our take up for the Huron Clean Water Project. And one of the things that we're focusing on is more um, um, sort of more cross promotion, so that our reforestation staff and our Huron Clean Water staff are working closely together to spread the word about both of those programs. So I'm going to let Phil now take it over again to talk about conservation areas. So we put more resources into <coughs> those two services, we got to take resources out of another area. So unfortunately, conservation areas is an area that our board is planning to reduce, trying to reduce our maintenance and our infrastructure costs. Uh, we own and manage 28 conservation areas, approximately 4,600 acres of, uh, of land, of swamps, river valleys, floodplains, river valleys that are used by thousands of people every year. <coughs> Uh, we have approximately $3.8 million worth of equipment and infrastructure to maintain. Most of this infrastructure is aging and in need of major maintenance or replacement. Next slide. So for example, we own two uh, mills in Gorey and Brussels. Uh, both buildings are surplus to our needs and in need of major repairs. So we've uh, been approaching those communities to see if there's any businesses or communities that might be interested in trying to refurbish those structures. So um, if we can't find anybody, then the board will have some tough decisions in terms of what we do with those structures. But they are surplus to our needs. Next slide, please. We also own three former mill dams in Brussels, Gory, and Bluebell. These structures are not flood control structures. Um, Maple Valley's boards identified them as uh, to be decommissioned once they're at the end of their serviceable life and or require major repairs or they're washed out in a flood. Uh, we don't have the funding to undertake any major repairs or replace these structures once uh, they reach the end of their lifespan. And we also have a campground up at Falls Reserve. Um, major repairs are required to the infrastructure at Falls Reserve. Our board has decided to try and lease out the area. Uh, we've just finished that RFP and we didn't receive any proposals. So in July, the board will be looking at some additional options of what to do uh, to do with that property. We did have a recreation, re recreational consultant look at the property and give us some options for what, uh, what we could do with it. Uh, Mainland Valley also has a lot of uh, turfed grass areas, as I know North Huron does as well. Uh, we both cut a lot of grass. We're working to find ways to reduce the amount, the amount of grass that's cut. We're planting more trees, shrubs, and wildflowers at our conservation areas. Uh, we're also working with spear seeds in Harriston to identify alternative turf mixtures to use that don't require as much cutting um, where we do have to have turf. The challenge we're finding is killing the existing turf um, before we plant a new mix. So. Moving over to corporate services, uh, the board's major priority is to, is to develop a stable funding base uh, for operating and essential infrastructure equipment. Our key challenge is that revenues have only recovered to 1993 levels, while our expenditures are in 2015 dollars. Uh, Maitland Valley Ford wants to limit uh, levy, levy increases going forward to between 55 and 58 thousand dollars per year uh, over the next three years. And our target is to have $60,000 in levy by 2017 that we can direct towards essential infrastructure and equipment. 
to reduce our infrastructure and equipment capital assets from 3.8 million down to 2.4 million, and to stabilize our operating budget uh, for flood and erosion safety and watershed stewardship extension. In order to maintain our core services and key infrastructure uh, in 2016, we're going to need an additional 73,000 uh, and an additional 15,000 for infrastructure and equipment for a total of 88,000, which leaves us with a shortfall of about 33,000 uh, going forward. So the reality is we're going to have to continue to use some of our accumulated surplus to put towards uh, the equipment and infrastructure deficit and our, and our operating deficit. Uh, one of the other things that's coming up is the provincial government is in the process of reviewing and updating the Conservation Authorities Act. This is something that our association has been urging the province to do for several years. Uh, the province will be reviewing and providing direction on the role and responsibilities of conservation authorities, uh, our governance structure, and our finance. And the proposed changes are expected to be released this month. So we would really appreciate it if uh, Council would review that document once it does come out and send comments in as one of the owners of, uh, of uh, conservation. So just in closing, uh, Maitland Valley's board realizes that business as usual is not a viable option for the future. And that's why we're making the uh, changes that we presented tonight. That's why we want to focus on doing a few important things uh, well. So we'd appreciate Council's feedback and comments on the, the changes that we are making. Okay, uh, not seeing any hands from Council, I will mention uh, at the end of Jane's presentation uh, that she mentioned about the current Green Water Project and that uh, just for everybody in the room, I will explain that uh, it's uh, the clean water project. If somebody has a project that you want to do that fits into it, uh, Doug Hawking from Maitland Valley will uh, take care of the uh, projects in Maitland Valley, help the people fill out the form so that it makes it very stress free for the owner to get the form filled out and uh, also because of Asabo Bayfield being uh, the other major uh, conservation authority, uh, Kate Monk does the work uh, for the Asabo Bayfield and that those projects go before a review committee of four, uh, two of which are county councillors uh, one represents agriculture and one uh, reps, represents the public at large. That, uh, so I have an intimate knowledge of what the projects are because I'm on the review committee uh, that reviews those projects. And that it is very, very interesting as to seeing the difference it has made and in the initial years, it was, I would say, fixing well, dry wells and bringing well casings up above the ground. But there were some terrible situations that could have meant contaminated water. And that uh, by virtue of contaminated water in a dry well, the water that could have went down beside the casing and uh, cause problems with the aquifer. So on that, council ready now for questions. Trevor? Yeah, I actually have a, a, first of a comment and I do have a question. Um, I, I, like, I like this work plan. And then the reason why I say that is because based on the information that we got at the emergency training before I was a counselor, I would say and, and not knowing from even this past weekend, the amount of rainfall that we're getting on a, on, a, on a basis and knowing what that potentially has risks to do for the municipality is, is key. So to me, flood and erosion and watershed stuff is 
should be the number one and number two priorities, not not down on the on the scale of what was in the past. So I really like the fact that the refocus is is back to where the municipalities really need the expertise, as opposed to as opposed to not because we're not watershed people. We're residents. I when it rains, I just hope it doesn't go in my face. <laughs> so yes, so. Well. <laughs> So that's where uh, I really like this work plan. Um, the question I have is when you talk about financing mm -hmm. and you talk about <coughs> the le limit the levy increases to between 50 and 58,000, is that per municipality or com the whole? The whole 15 whole, municipalities. The whole 15. Okay. Which is split based on your assessment. Based on your assessment. So I think Sorry, the current is about reason. seven or eight percent. So if they'll answer the question, I'm not going to have a major center here. Was it kind of, it, it's in the same position as what the Gory Dam is and the uh, you know, Well, it's or certainly an aging structure and we were looking at trying to raise money for a new structure, but the board's put that on hold right now uh, until we finish going through our restructuring here and see. Um, Infrastructure, as you know, is expensive to maintain and operate. So, we look at the numbers: 176 million worth of development at risk, and flooding and erosion, and almost five billion dollars worth of farmland. And our board thinks that's where we should be putting our resources to protecting those resources. That's sort of the foundation of the economy. So, when a lot of this infrastructure was done in the 70s, you know, the baby boomers were young, and they wanted people to get out and so see, you know, go camping and things like that. Wasn't many campgrounds around, for example. So they used to provide an 85% grant to start a place like Falls Reserve. Well, you know, now there's eight campgrounds in that area, including Point Farms. The province has a lot deeper pockets than we do. So we're looking at do we need to be in the camping business anymore? You know, what in the 70s, it fit, but in 2015, maybe it doesn't anymore. So that's the kind of decisions we're having to make. Same with our education program. You know, maybe we need to instead of having a structure, we need to go to the school, the conservation areas instead of them coming to us and having to build infrastructure. I'll keep saying it's very expensive to operate, as you guys know. Just one more kind of question. Scott ends up with bringing the watershed rescue is there is there a lot to do there? Well, the four upstream landowners are interested in in doing some things to control the runoff on their property. And at the bottom end on the Hussey property, uh, there's some work that's to be done there too. So it's going to be dependent upon funding. It'd be nice if we could do all the work through the drainage act. That would be the best way to do it going forward is we can change the approach by engineers and landowners to want to slow it down, spread it out, and soak it in instead of Send it to the lake as fast as possible. Well, not seeing any other questions. Thank you very much, uh, Phil and Jane, for the presentation. Thank you for allowing us to come. <coughs> So the next deputation is uh, landowners uh, adjacent to uh, the G to G trail. Marie, uh, Neil and Marie Mitchell, uh, I, it looks like you got the short straw for uh, being spokesman. Yeah, right? I sure did. <laughs> Okay, yeah, well, welcome. Um, is there a stick for pictures? Have you got it? Okay. Uh, can you introduce the one to the wet you can see? Yep, yep. Uh, good evening, Mr. Reed, counselor, staff, and guests. There's a, I don't know, a group of landowners against the G2G trail. And uh, Ken Glenville and Betty Glenville will be here with me, Susan the and my wife. And uh, 
there's a fair few more, but we're spread out with other council meetings now too. So we're getting thin and busy. So <laughs> anyway, um, tonight we'd like to bring your attention to the concerns and comments of the majority of the landowners to the proposed uh, Goddard's Wealth Rail Trail. Uh, well, we understand there are potential benefits in this trail. Um, there are too many adverse effects for adjacent landowners uh, to support the trail. The concerns are not as simple as not in my backyard, but uh, for landowners next to the trail, we are farmers and this will impact our livelihood because uh, for us, it splits our farm in half um, and for a fair few other people and then crossing with machinery and dealing with all the other people going through the middle of our farm is, you know, uh, concerns for us. And, and uh, on June 4th, 2014, concerned that Jason Agriculture Landowners addressed County Council regarding our concern. It was mentioned that we would be consulted, but over a year later, and still no action involving landowners from uh, imagine our surprise when G2G uh, Inc. announced the full trail would be open on July 1st. This amount, announcement preceded any lease being signed to ensure the success of any project. Community involvement is vital, yet G2G has never contacted us as adjacent landowners. The only contact the landowners have had is a public meeting in uh, November 2013 and two letters from the planning department, one in 2014, and uh, the other in May of 2015, which uh, after G2G's announcement that it was going to be open, um, they sent out a, a letter saying there'd be another public meeting in the fall. <laughs> uh, Further compounding the problem, the fact that the, not all landowners are receiving the small amount of communication that's been coming through, not everybody's getting it. Um, so it's a, kind of a one-way street with the, they seem to know everything and we seem to know nothing. So uh, the proposed trail dissects farm businesses, which seem to be uh, no problem, but would we put a path directly to a store regardless of the impact of the store? No. The farm properties along the trail are businesses and must be treated as such. Our farm businesses have been sent letters but have not been consulted. Uh, the primary issues at the top of our list are the financial implications and safety. Safety of the users and the landowners is of utmost concern. Heavy equipment regularly goes across if you own farms on both sides and uh, uh, how do we prepare for potential accidents and how do the emergency personnel know where it is or how do they get there um, uh, on the topic of safety we also need to consider wildlife and the safety to species at risk in our area uh, I think you've had enough meal that we need to do some talking. Uh, yeah. Her bed. Good evening. Thank you. Regular use can also mean misuse, such as litter, excessive noise, at unreasonable hours, and how are the landowners to deal when these issues occur? If a steward group were to be used for complaints, how are they chosen and advertised to be used? The farm businesses will be faced with increased costs and in many cases reduced revenue. There are insurance companies that have already indicated that by adding an additional public access to the farm, the farm will have to carry more liability insurance, increasing their yearly cost. Secure waste receptacle stations should be required and maintained. Full fencing would be required, and what will the ultimate cost be, and who is covering the cost? A rough number for 40 kilometers of 4.5 foot page wire fence with a barbed wire above, just along one side of the trail, not both, 
could be between four hundred and sixty thousand to sixty thousand dollars, not including the HST and depending on the conditions. Additionally, if every crossing has one 16-foot diamond bar gate in the gateway on one side, the installed cost could be 450 to 500. <coughs> These costs are merely estimates that do not include the preparation of the land for the fences being installed. And this doesn't even take into account the bridges that need replaced as taxpayers, we do not want to be putting up for this uh, job, paying out for this job. I only have a few rough numbers, and this already feels extremely expensive. We will, we will, we really bring in enough tourism to break even. Each farm will be affected differently. The main areas in which revenue will be lost are on reduced yields commodity specific contracts that offer premiums or are a specialty crop. Some farms will no longer qualify for main, many specific contracts for specialty crops put in. Yet another consideration would be that even with best management practices, local farms are at a greater biosecurity risk. How does one control disease transmission and enforce use of biosecurity measures while on the trail, especially as some of the barns are very close to the trail and are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So in April, G to G put out a press release stating that the full trail would be open for use in July. This is, even though they didn't have a lease in place, and in fact, G to G will not be able to get a lease for the full trail since there's already numerous ongoing leases and contracts with current lease holders. Those contracts are held with Dell Management. <clears throat> to say the least, that press release seemed deceitful. And is this type of misleading information demonstrative of the way that G to G, that G, to G is going to do business? At this point, it seems like they're an unreliable and untrustworthy partner. Therefore, when G2G Inc. states the trail groups will cover all the costs for the above costs that we've already mentioned, can they be trusted? Or is this just another empty promise? Like being consulted seems to have been for us landowners. Our communities already have a hard enough time paying for local recreation facilities, for important things like the, the Maitland Conservation. The local ratepayers don't need another continuous cost. As landowners, we can't support the proposed trail. As landowners affected by this 24 seven, we urge you to stop this development. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh, is council any questions? <coughs> any comments? Trevor. I think from from I share the same comments or concerns that the landowners have. And we haven't seen, as a counselor you know, since October, I have not seen one document from G to G other than that press release that would, that would provide me any comfort that, that that type of stuff is gonna get resolved. So um, I think we've, we've talked about it before at this, at this, in this chamber that we aren't gonna support anything until we get firm information, firm guidance and, and direction. So I think that doesn't change. It still hasn't changed my opinion of the of the trail. It hasn't changed my opinion of the entire development. I wanna see I wanna see what their their plans are and, and what what mitigation they're gonna do for the landowners and and uh, and the liability of the municipalities and, and all that kind of stuff. 
this is a bigger fish than just a trail. This is a bigger, bigger, bigger monster than uh, I think uh, one I think GG thinks it is. And then for us, we just aren't at the point where I can support anything until I see some more information. Anyways, mm -hmm. Jim, July first is when this. This real fish open. So what do we do between now and July first? Like, We're I'm asking I'm ourselves the same that. question because we've got a lease right. that says we've got the contract on our part. Um, We're going to county council sometime to the eighth of July. Eighth of July and uh, see what what they have to say. But uh, I, I mean, I don't know. That's about all we were able to do, I guess. So. so the question is, if there, if, if there is no lease, there's no approval to be on that land. They have an agreement somewhere with some people, but I call Dell Management and my lease is still valid. As but, is the townships. Uh, uh, the lease that North Huron is all completely valid. So, so the, I guess the, not necessarily only the concern to the, the landowners; it's also a concern to the to the users of the trail that they potentially are trespassing if, if they don't have if, if it's not a valid trail. So, I, I think it's again, I think it's a whole cumbersome issue that I'm really not sure anybody has really all the information or all the answers for. It. And until that happens, I don't know how anybody can say it's open. <laughs> like, like, I yeah. Yet, when it's published in the paper that voila, here we go, all of a sudden we have an increase in traffic of ATVs that apparently aren't going to be permissible on this trail. But they're, they're flipping us the bird and telling us, you know what, the trail's open. Our, our property is fenced at either end. So they don't go on the trail, they go on a cross. We've had, like, and it's occasional. We've had a dozen people that we've seen when we're not busy <coughs> come across our crops since what I would say is an irresponsible announcement. And I asked our management and I'm liable if they let our cattle out. Like we used to pasture that, but uh, I can't take the chance on pasturing the railway property anymore because if somebody lets them out, I'm liable. And we get to pay more insurance. <laughs> and oh, we didn't even put this in. <laughs> Up at uh, nearer to the Godrich end of the trail, they asked permission to plant milkweed. So, any of you who had anything to do with farming, you know how welcome that would be. So, text the bottom line, I'd rather now, come on. Um, <laughs> well, I I'm like maybe it. more I'm interested far. in, <laughs> in uh, the fact that we've managed to control weeds at great cost. Which, one of the seed contracts I have, he said, uh, once that happens, He'll have to reassess things because he's not going to fight that battle cleaning seed that's stained with milkweed. So he said he'll have to look at that whether I get it again or not once they start doing that. So, I mean, and there's just so many things, and they want the county to be on the hook for all of this. And they get grant money that's taken away from the Maitland Valley and everything else to do all of this stuff on the trail. And then they want the county to come on board. Why? So they can look after the liability, they can upkeep it, uh, the infrastructure costs all this money, and then when they get sick of it, they download it onto the municipalities. Um, I mean, just from a staff perspective, it's um, it's very challenging. We're not able to speak about, it, or we informed about the lease between Dell Management and GDG. Um, but I would, you know, suggest that um, council could invite them as a delegation G to G to come and speak to hear, to answer the questions that we're all asking here, which don't we don't have the answers to. 
Um, uh, the other piece that would be interesting for staff to have would be uh, your resident group or your farm group are organized on how many farmers is it impacting inside North Huron, um, agricultural growers, uh, to understand that because I've tried to look at maps and try and calculate that out um, just to understand North Huron's position in, in my reports and, and staff information on this issue. So it'd be good to get a listing of that if we can do that. Be interesting to ask G to G if they, in the four years they've been dreaming this up, if they bother to contact any one of the landowners. Um, but just the, in partially answering that, well, North Huron doesn't have that many uh, farming properties. The, to my knowledge, it's really only four or five that uh, like over the five acres type of thing that would be affected. But the thing of it is, uh, the affected landowners uh, adjacent to it are trying to visit uh, all five uh, municipalities that have some. So that uh, that's part of it that North Huron didn't get left out just because we're the smallest number. Back. And just from speaking with um, other groups, I believe it's that, that it is somewhat the province that is, uh, has this dream of this G2G trail. And um, it would be interesting possibly to um, request information from our MPP's office. It's another opportunity there to understand what the province's uh, desire is. Um, I'm just providing information. I have to be very careful to uh, cross lines on on the thing, I'm not sure about the province because, what was it, 1992, there was a very strong push and the, the adjacent landowners at that time basically called it the Groundhog Day Committee because it just kept recurring every so often. It was the same thing again and again. Yolanda. Um, have you talked with other landowners in other counties about how they're dealing with the GDG project and um, it coming through in their leases and stuff and how it's affecting? Well, I've talked to some, some in Perth and uh, it's kind of a same deal there. There's no doubt some for it, but then uh, the ones that are against, same thing. They're, they're not addressing problems or they're telling everybody they're addressed, but yet they're not when it comes to it and uh, thinking over to now they're starting some of them are starting to boycott businesses in Milverton that have supported it and so it's uh, an but issue down there too the surveys that I wasn't very success successful at flashing on the screen there at the beginning um, there was a survey done through uh, your County Federation of Agriculture of adjacent landowners when all of this started in 2013. Um, I think there's 123 adjacent landowners and 76 of them returned the survey. That's incredible, <laughs> survey return. Um, and the majority of landowners had grave concerns about the impact that this would have on their farm businesses, on their homes, on their businesses, on their properties. I think there were some of those surveys were delivered after the deadline. And those surveys never got answered. I know two in particular well, and for these that or in the uh, yearnings that fair enough. And I mean I wouldn't say that this the survey return rate is very much good at the county level either. None of those concerns have been addressed. Uh, Ken Glanville here, and uh, the G to G has already written a portion of this rail bed. Why I cannot understand they want the county to lease it because there's one thing I have in mind and that's tax increases. They talk of uh, bicyclists leaving $142 a day. No, $186. $186. 
Well, I would like to turn the table and charge them $150 a day to use it. Maybe that would take the pressure off the taxpayer because I agree with municipalities that cannot keep their uh, arenas running properly, they're in a the deficit there. Like, we need help under where the damned old rail bed that is supposed to be used in case they put in a pipeline or something. And to open up this infested weed mess and transport them from one end to the other, like there's some they're very dangerous weeds up there. I didn't bring a list, but all you got to do is uh, visit Ridgetown, they'll tell you about it. It scares the hell out of you. But anyhow, uh, I wish we could have your support to help the farming community that really does bring in some big dollars, employs a mega people. Let's not put more burden on the farmers because of this. But, uh, the survey that Marie was uh, uh, referring to, it was in the Niagara wine country as a per kilometer trail. They, uh, yes. it was, and that they figured it would be the same. I wouldn't say that's apple staff. I don't know. I'm a pretty good yeah. shopper and I can't spend <laughs> very much money at all between Mountain and Glide. And take it over to bike. <laughs> okay, uh, is there any more questions? <clears throat> okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and uh, making your views known. We'd like to thank you to for listening to our concerns. Okay. Um, moving on to reports. <coughs> but, uh, start out with the Reeves report. Uh, Alice Monroe Festival went very well. Uh, but, uh, there was 250 uh, or so partook in it, and that that's a little bit of an increase. Uh, I hope that some younger writers from other areas will be able to place next year with uh, two of the three younger writers being from Godridge and the other from St. Mary's. It looks like a little bit of the home crowd, but uh, I can say the judging was definitely not home-based, so that uh, it was very good. Uh, also, this past weekend, Friday didn't look very good for Musical Muskrat Festival, but uh, Saturday uh, uh, was very good. Uh, the Midway did real well uh, with the Lions Club collecting bicycles for uh, underprivileged in other countries. Uh, there was 76 bicycles turned in to be uh, sent. And one of the really good things, there was over $2,700 collected uh, for the food bank uh, in donations. So that, that was great as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so that uh, I think I'll go to the county council report. Last Wednesday, uh, county council did part of a road tour and that uh, basically we started out at the port of godridge and heard uh, the revised plans after compass uh, minerals backed out of the 45 million dollars that they had supposedly committed to it so it's being taken back to approximately 17 million that will be going ahead right away. That will give approximately three acres of uh, dredging and a new uh, wharf front. Uh, from there, uh, we headed across to Clinton and seen uh, where in the Clinton Fire Hall, there's space being uh, 
earmarked and uh, worked on to fill out uh, what is needed for EMS uh, to do their headquarters there. Uh, then the county is trading a street for another street in Clinton, uh, County Road 13 that goes out to Bayfield. It's sort of a what steeplechase route, Laura? Or are you familiar with that one? Uh, well, it's crazy the way it goes. Uh, we're trading for the street that goes right up along the railway, and uh, so that big trucks will not have trouble making the corners, and that uh, that what had been in the end of County Road 13 will be taken over by Central Huron. So that's a, a trade. Uh, we went out to the Huron View site and County Council last summer made a deal with Huron Soil and Crop to handle the 32 acres or so at the back of the property. And that we've seen the results of the cover crop that they put in of uh, cereal ryegrass, uh, at the rate of about 40 pounds per acre, uh, which is relatively thin uh, in commercially, but great for erosion control. And uh, with all the rain last Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday, there was no visible signs of uh, erosion that it had done the job and that it was three weeks ago it was a green crop when they planted the soybeans into it uh, it was about 30 inches high uh, two and a half weeks later the soybeans were up about like that nice and the straw from the rye was uh, pretty well all under a foot high and it had protected the, so the soil uh, from the impact of the raindrops enough to keep from stirring soil and losing it so that uh, uh, a very promising uh, situation for a start with the uh, Huron soil and crop taking care of the property. Um, then we went on to Huron uh, to see uh, the Homes for the Aged uh, Huron View. And that after a tour there, I had to leave before they went back uh, to Zurich Library and uh, they stopped in <coughs> at the Blue Water Center uh, to see what was going on there as whether the county would be looking at it as trying to precipitate something happening there. Um, so that this Wednesday, there will be an audit committee meeting, day one, and then day two. So uh, that's it for the county. Um, moving on to 6.3, the financial report. Um, the, any questions on the account? Trevor? Um, page one. <coughs> it has Canadian commercial. Um, just not sure what that it says for commercial vacancy. Is that a rebate of some type? Yes. So um, under the legislation that we operate, if a commercial or industrial property meets the set out criteria by the province they are allowed to receive a 30% um, vacancy rebate on their taxes. So there's an application process. It has to be <coughs> through impact to find out how much of the um, area is actually vacant and meets the criteria. And then the um, impact provides us with that information, which we verify. Then we apply our tax rate to that amount of assessment and then we give it to them in the form of a rebate. So it's not something that's automatically from year to year. 
Um, we have to meet the criteria each year, and we have to fill in the application that's submitted on time. And this Canadian commercial, it's the third party, that's the third party who actually no, gives that's them the rebate? No, that's the name of the business. That would be the old um, dollar store. Oh, okay, sorry. So I, just, I wasn't sure whether that was an actual business here in town or that yes. was a third party. Okay. Um, page four. I'm hoping it's more than one filing cabinet at the cemetery. That's one filing cabinet? Is there gold in it? That's uh, fireproof. Fireproof. <clears throat> okay. If we lose those records, we, we've lost a lot. We've lost a lot. Like, are we responsible for those records, like with the ministry? Is that the issue? Well, and for our own. Protection yeah. of and for all section of who's there. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, page five. The check to our <laughs> Dave's borrowing for ESTC burn building material. What what exactly is that? Sure. Um, last year, uh, uh, scrap steel and new steel vendor uh, was closing out, and we were able to buy fabricated steel components at. Uh, rate of 50 cents a pound. Catch as it was COD because they're going into business. North Shore can't do the COD part, so yours truly paid for the, uh, the equipment. And then that uh, would put an issue back in uh, for reimbursement. Okay. We were in the lame duck period, so the council could not make the purchase at that time. Okay. And page 10. What remind me again which property we're, we're paying for property tax for waste for the central here on? The landfill site, the Blythe Hall at landfill site, which they administer. Okay, sorry, yeah. that's it for me. Thank you. Any other council questions? Bill, page four. Where are we paying right? This is going to be the one maybe to the other. So um, he does all of the grass cutting um, that the big um, mowers don't do, and um, we pay him. He uses his own equipment and field to perform that task. So we have a contract to pay him three hundred dollars per month uh, to do that service over the summer months. Because the bit larger equipment can't get close into the hangars and into the buildings. And so it's kind of a lawn area that he does that for us. Some of that was over the painting and job description or a part time. There's uh, acres and acres of grass that get cut out of the airport. So his lawn cutting is not part of the um, job description that is paid inside his hours. Um, it's on top of those hours and duties, and we contract him out because he uses his own equipment to pay him a flat fee. Page okay, nine, uh, John Shank. It says Mill. Is that for the Mill Street uh, right away? Is that what that's for? It's, yes, um, it's, um, part of that is for the um, um, the legal fees that we actually had to pay, $900 of it is the actual easement fee that we have to pay um, to acquire the easement to um, English for, uh, like under the bylaw that we passed last year. And then the balance is, um, there's some registration fees in there, but about a thousand uh, dollars of it is actually their legal costs that we had to pay to get that transaction completed. I'm unclear what you said. No, but I'm uh, afraid that was fine. Hey, Jay, Jasmine Fisher, trade for 40 dollars from the Is that for sure? Um, I'm not sure if it was all mileage, but that was a course that she was attending, and I believe it was in the Toronto area. I'd have to give you the exact information on that. I have to sign up on that expense. She's one of our fitness instructors and requires a certification. To teach the classes. Yeah, the oh, here it is. Sorry, I thought I'd go out. You're good. 
so there was uh, mileage, some accommodation in there, and meals as well to make the total of 340 and 71 uh, to attend uh, a yoga training course in GTA. And before you ask, yes, that's the only place it's offered. No, no, that wasn't my question. I was going to say that should have been broken out. I can't hear you. It should have been broken out in registration. He was not filling his mileage. So, um, there's a second question on mileage. Page 15, Steve Carter. Who designer designed it? Another one. Alice Monroe Mileage. $406. Ryan O'Connor? Is that Ryan O'Connor? Yeah, that'll be part of the Alice Monroe Label Market Partnership project. So we just paid him four hundred and six dollars in mileage to so for what what over a long period this is every one month. Where did he go? I believe that is when he came here to do some research on the different cultural um, cultural and museums around in the area. And then he came for a workshop with some of the stakeholders for the Alice Mill um, Labor Market Partnership. It's say page 15. Museum advertising. It's getting charged back to the Alice Green Energy. That's fine. Well, what did we advertise for $800 million of the citizens of the museum? Page 15. The citizens. There's a museum advertising. Two charges, actually. At $880, now we're at 30 45 Um, so the eight hundred and eighty dollars is a variety of things. There is um um, again, we only have 19 characters, so we can't put all the description in, but I have the invoice here, so it covers a bunch of the um, programs over at the museum. They had some, the bar dance page, the Edwardian Tees, it also covers stops along the way, the summer issue, and it also covers the Playa Campground. Um, summertime listings, but we just can't list it all there because there's just no way to do it. We can either put one word advertising or um, pick which kind of section it is the biggest one. I guess what bothers me about that is that you, you were saying museum advertising, but you just mentioned a live campground. So that's really a charge that should be charged back against the live campground, not against the museum. Right, and we do, as, as we, each one of the invoices, they're all coded individually to their departments, but we just can't list them all on this on this limited space, so that's why we welcome you to ask different questions about them. Okay. Enough for me. Any other questions? Okay, uh, uh, the motion would be that the Council of the Township of North Huron approve the bills and accounts in the amount of one million one hundred and six thousand eight hundred and fifty six and ninety seven cents as of June twelfth. Do I have a mover? Trevor? Yolanda? Any further questions? All in favor? Carry. Uh, 6.4 uh, uh, economic development 6.41 Alice Monroe Festival and short story update. Do you just want to try? That was just for your information. We don't have a, an official um, update yet. The committee did meet today for the first meeting afterwards, um, and they will get a report to you probably, I would say, near the end of summer. So, once we get everything more Okay, uh, 6.42, the Recreation and Facilities Department, uh, North Huron fee waiving and donation policy. Uh, um, so I guess I uh, wanted to share with Council um, our first uh, attempt at a draft policy and we believe that we've got 
We spent a lot of time back and forth on this. We reviewed a lot of municipal <laughs> policies. Um, Donna and myself have worked together as a team on this, and we um, so Sharon has been on board. We've got, met with her a few times. The challenge is to create a policy that could possibly meet any potential situation. Um, so what we provided for you here is uh, for donations really it's a procedure. Council can donate as much or as little as they choose as requested. Um, what we've tried to accomplish here is to provide a one time that they are submitted prior to budget timing so that council can review them all at once and assess them, decide which donations they want to approve, and then it can be put into the budget, which is good planning. Um, so that's really where the donation side of things is coming in. The waiving of fees, um, the fees that are in the fee bylaw, uh, especially for facilities, are already at a community rate when we're um, using them here. And so we were trying to come up with a policy that would make sense. And so um, the donation of North Huron's discount is the donation already coming from council. So we have a community rate and we have a public rate for most of our facilities and services. And so when a group is doing a community activity, they're receiving the community rate and that is at a discount. And so that would be the donation that council is making to that event. Um, then if you have um, a situation, I'll use the recent example of the Musical Muskrat Festival, which would be a committee of council. And um, as uh, our CAO will be bringing forward to council, um, those uh, committees are now going to be required to, or we're going to look to have terms of reference set. And inside those terms of reference, we would be able to determine with that group ahead of any event um, precisely what discount or free facilities or in kind services they would receive from the township as part of the initiative that they're about to take on on behalf of the township as a committee of council. And so those would be exempt or on the side from this fee waiving policy. I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm sure there's a, included in here is our report, as well as just a sample, um, a list of the 2013 fees that have been waived for your information, donations that um, are, have been approved through the budget process, or already decisions made at council and ones that are pending. There are some more in the agenda. And then our sample policy for your review. So the motion is that for council to hereby accept the draft North Carolina fee waiving policy as presented and request staff to prepare an authorizing bylaw for the next council meeting. Discussion. James, how are you going to get all these groups to put in their petition by November 1st? But, so, um, as Dawn and I have uh, discussed, and, and along with Sharon, um, anyone who is currently receiving a donation um, would this year receive a letter in advance telling them that this is the new requirement and um, what's, what's due. If something comes in after the fact, um, then I guess it would be regretfully de declined and please make sure you get your requested for next year by the deadline. But anyone who's currently receiving a donation will be notified ahead of time uh, of the new policy. Trevor. So in saying that, is there going to be some public, public, um, advertising of this policy for the ones that don't haven't sent one in the past if you're sending ones to the ones that have sent in the past the ones that don't know the change in the policy they could be at a lock so i, I think i like the fact that we have the, the date but i'm just concerned that with all with advertising there is no matter amount of money that you can spend on advertising and somebody's going to say i didn't know that so I just think we need to be clear on what, how we lay that part out, mm -hmm. just so, just so there isn't any concern that we don't get any negative feedback from that we're trying to harness something that we're not really trying to do. Thank you. 
you want to go ahead. Um, so we can try to do some extra communication around that. Um, obviously, for people who send in donation requests annually, we can send a letter right to them. <coughs> it may also be a good idea to send a letter to service clubs because that's going to catch a lot of our local volunteer organizations. Um, and, uh, you know, we can try to talk to the BIAs and, and get the word out as much as we can. Put it on our municipal website and uh, hopefully we can uh, we can try to get the word out, and it'll be a learning process, I'm sure, the first year. But uh, personally, I thought we can notify the ones that we usually give a yearly grant to. Uh, what I thought was that we maybe have a small fund for those that come in, uh, where we could take care of, say, what, two or three uh, within a year. That's sort of the average of what the other grants are, and that that would uh, possibly get some of those deserving projects uh, where we would have it in the budget that they could be covered. Trevor? My only concern, Reed, by doing that though, is if you make exceptions, you might as well take the November 1st away. Because if you make exceptions for, for those special cause and people, there is always going to be people who use the term special cause for their, their, lack of, their lack of organization is our all of a sudden emergency. So I understand what you're, you're saying, but if you do that, you might as well take the, the November 1st away because you, you, you have a blanket for everybody the same process. Because if you make exceptions, there, there is going to be people who always fall into that exception. Uh, the, what I was meaning, where we get requests to provide facility free of charge for uh, somebody that has traumatic accident, uh, house burnt, and they're having a fundraiser for them. That is what I'm meaning more than groups that have a yearly thing that are it's for those things that happen one year and that it would not carry over to other years. Yeah, so just so I'm clear, November 1st is all the back deadline is only for cash donations, correct? Correct, yes. So everything else they can send it in any day or any week or any month or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess um, the way the policy is written now is that fees will not be reduced um, in any situation except for the reduction that is already offered through council. And I guess in any circumstance, council can um, always make exceptions. Here's, but I guess what we're trying to suggest is that the discount being offered is already a discount. If somebody is offering a fundraising event, um, often they have other expenses, a DJ, food, <coughs> bar, insurance. And then we're turning around and waiving the fee on the rental. And the municipality has a lot of expenses in our infrastructure, maintenance, capital investment, and so on. And we're trying to suggest that the facilities should be receiving um, the minimal community rate for rentals, regardless of the circumstance. However, that, that's a real change from how council has operated in the past when it comes to waiving fees. So it's, it's on the table here for your discussion, but that's just a little bit different than definitely how it's been done in the past. Correct. So I, I, in, in making difficult decisions on, on operating, I like that part. Like I like the part where, where I'm concerned is, are people aware of the difference between a public rate and a, a communicate and a community group because that conversation and saying, well, you could be this, but you're actually going to charge this, and here's what you're really getting reduced by. That information might help with the fact of that you're not. Yeah, you're going to have to pay, and that's um, we have to run a business the same as everybody else. So, um, I like that part. I like the exception with the reciprocal agreement. That is what we have today, um, and it is. It's a. It's a. It's going to be a hard sell because it's not the norm. It hasn't been the norm, 
But I think from what we've learned in our budget process, things have to change when it comes to services um, that for, for all groups, not only not only the fundraising groups, but any any organization within the municipality that's gonna necessarily need our 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 service. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I would agree, and, and that entered a lot into our discussions. And um, again, I think it's going to be important to communicate this <coughs> positively. We can send out communication to our service clubs again uh, who received that community rate. And really, it's all about long term sustainability of our facilities. So, at the end of the day, as we already noted tonight, those facilities run at a deficit, and that deficit is funded by the taxpayer. We've discussed through our budget deliberations and our brainstorming session after that that we need to find ways to maximize our revenue to make those facilities as viable as possible. And unfortunately, that means you know sometimes we're going to have to say no on the freebies. Great. Uh, this question for you now. Like I, I go back to we got. Uh, <coughs> Rentals of six hundred and three dollars. So just back to two thousand fourteen. Eighty five dollars ten permanent, hundred dollars for light guards, and then in kind staff time for fence setup, garbage pickup each day, cleanup. Can you like is that all expense? So that's all kept track of because that's our employees and it's probably weekend work too, right? That it can't be done. So is it an expense to the township? Yes. But is it expensed currently back to the muskrat festival in that specific example no but what i would suggest going forward is that the muskrat festival is a committee of council and so before we venture into the 2016 uh that the terms of reference would be established with the muskrat festival and all of the gives and gets and takes and the take backs and where the proceeds are going to go and if they make money what cross you know will that come back to the township those should all be laid out ahead of time so that all of those expenses, but at this point, all of those expenses are being um, approved as um, as donations or waived fees to that group at this time. So if they were to profit from their event, perhaps there would be something in the terms of reference that <coughs> that money would come back towards park redevelopment and the township would take that and put that into reserves for long-term management of the parks or the, the facilities that they're using or things like that. Sometimes these groups give back to the community, but not necessarily to a North Huron project or North Huron facility. And I guess if we're giving as North Huron for items, we would like to be able to direct some of those things back. But those would be handled in a terms of reference with that group that is doing that event at the time that they're, before they get into their, their activities and events. Does that answer? Yes, that's what should be done. Do we have a costing figure for what it costs us to have our staff go out on a normal weekend, put up the put up boulevard or stop stop the traffic, and then we have a long weekend. Does our staff get paid extra for coming in on the long weekend to do the same put up barricades and all this kind of stuff? These are the kind of costs that we really don't count on but as a taxpayer i'm paying those costs and i think some of these costs need to be these people need to know okay this is going to cost us more than what we would donate to this project and they need to know what it costs us especially for a long weekend and a normal weekend because there, there is a big difference there and we're expecting our staff to be a part of that and some of those staff it's a long weekend they're going away I guess I have to answer the question about what staff rates are paid out at better than I can. It probably doesn't really matter whether it's a weekend or a long weekend because by the time the weekend comes, if our staff come into work, they put in their hours for the year and they're going to be in an overtime position already. Or if they come in on a long weekend, then they're in a statutory holiday position. So they're going to get time and a half for those hours either way. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be able to spill that out to to the groups that work. This is what it's actually costing us to do that. <coughs> and I think we'll get into more discussion when we get to my committee's report. Yes, I'm okay. it ties yeah. in as well. Bill, yeah. I'm not going to go over all those again, but I do agree. Paul, this is a wonderful thing. I think you've done a good job on bringing it this far 
So one thing I want to just note under a discussion where it says continue to honor the partnerships and reciprocal agreements exist. I'd like to make very clear that when there has to be provision in here on an annual basis that we will look at each and every one of them and not give carte blanche to somebody just because you were there last year, we're gonna give you the same thing next year. It has to be very clearly stated that it will be reviewed annually, whether they're a committee of council or not. And unless it's an approach or embedded in a bylaw, then we can still review that. But I think we have to review each and every one of them and their contribution earns here on an annual basis before we rubber stamp them for the next year. Yeah, so when it's a reciprocal agreement, I'm referring to um, things like um, the school board agreement, which can be updated annually and reviewed annually if either party chooses. Um, items like the <coughs> freshers uh, agreement, I believe that's on a five year term. The Blythe Memorial Hall and the Blythe Festival, that's a five year term. So they wouldn't be done annual, but they are brought as agreements to council as whole and adopted as bylaw. Those agreements are intact and then they're set out for so many years. The other ones would be more what um, Sharon's going to review later, which would be the committees of council, and, and those would be laid out each time one of those terms of reference is um, adopted by council. Some of them might make sense to do every two years, depending on the length of an event or what they're doing, but I, I understand what you're saying, and that's, I think, what we're trying to accomplish here is to review each donation and each fee expense on a regular basis, but may not be annually. Well, then, uh, but there has to be provision for review, and yes, I know we've got five year agreements and some of the three year agreements, but they have to, be, they have to be reviewed. And when we do that, we have to have those hard costs. I mean, those are really costly to, to give us a less hard cost. Uh, the suggested uh, motion for this is that the council, the township of North here, hereby accept the draft. North Huron fee waiving policy as presented and request staff to prepare the authorizing bylaw for the July 6, 2015 council meeting. Bill and Ray. All in favor? Carry. Okay. Uh, um, so what we'd like to do um, tonight as well is to go through, um, so some of these requests have been sitting here for months, so we would like to just get a few of them off our plate tonight if we could quickly on the donation side of things. So on the top of page three, um, under donations, your historic list that we've been giving to have is listed there. So that is the elementary school fair, 300, live festival outreach, 1500, live horticultural, 750, and there may be some discussions on that one due to the new <coughs> club. Wing and horticultural, 750, Wing and Firefighters Association, 550, here in County Farm Home and Safety. 125, here in Plowman's Association, 125, Big Brothers and Sisters, 125, Children's Aid, 500, United Way, 500. Included in that budget, our budget for what we call community partnerships was 11.8. All of those were included in there, as well as two others, which was our $4,700 marketing agreement with the Blythe Festival and the $850 um, tourist booth um, with the Blythe Festival. So those two, all with those two included, that adds up to 10775 leaving 825 unaccounted for. So point A is what our um, staff um, recommendation would be that all of those be approved as they were in the budget for 2015 and a letter sent out with them saying this is the last year for um, the this budget process and we have adopted a new policy and the um, all of the information that goes out with that that their their requests have to be in by November 1st etc so second to that, since again, since time is running out, um, we have the schools and we have some, we've had contact from the three schools. So um, we, at Hullet Public School, 
they have always in the past received fifty dollars and it's due next week for their big H's, which is um, um, a designation that the kids can receive. Maitland River, we've been giving $50 towards their graduation. And at Sacred Heart School, we've been giving $50 to the most improved North Huron student. Now, those come out of another area of the budget. Part of this process, too, is we want to amalgamate all of these into one section of the budget. And again, because time has basically run out for those three, um, I would also like to have council either approve those and have those sent out next week in time for graduation. Again, with a letter stating, this is, there's gonna be a new policy in place next year and um, that there'll be a new procedure to follow for next year. So those three as well. And another one that you have on the table was um, we had several presentations from the North Huron Food Chair. And as I said, you have $825 mm -hmm. unaccounted for, but you have many new requests this year, which include, as I said, the North Huron Food Chair. You had a request from the Wingham Golf and Curling Club, Belgrade Summer Festival, and I think there's two more in tonight's agenda package as well, vying for that unaccounted for $825. So to take you back to this mm -hmm. list, our historic list um, that we have approved as part of the budget, is council interested in adopting and approving that listing tonight to have that go out with a letter explaining the new policy? Bill, can you just really quickly, on that historic list, real quickly, just run down here and say each one of these that was on that historic list. Okay, Real so quick. so they're the top ones at the page. The elementary school fair, three hundred. Yeah. Live festival youth outreach, fifteen hundred. Live horticultural society, seven fifty. And I made a note about depending what happens there. Wingham horticultural society, seven fifty. Wingham firefighters association for fireworks, five hundred and fifty. Here in county, fire home and safety, one hundred and twenty five. Here in Plowman's Association, 125. Big Brothers and Sisters, 125. Children's Aid uh, Program, 500. And United Way, 500. And then in addition, I mentioned that historically we've included the Blythe Festival um, Operating Management Agreement in here, which it doesn't really belong, but it's for $4,700 because it is under a written agreement and along with the Blythe tourist um, booth that the festival operates on your behalf. So it's not actually a street donation either, but historically it's been in this category for 850. So those ones are the historical ones. Okay. All of those were in the budget, correct? Yes. There was initial budget? Okay. I, I would be willing to say let's go ahead and do that because we did budget from the exception of Blythe Horticultural Society, which we're going to have to defer because it right. is being like So I, I would make that motion and go ahead and do that. Get that off the table. Do I have a seconder? James? Uh, the one thing that I would say is it isn't a fiduciary conflict of interest, but being involved with the, the elementary school fair. And uh, being president of Karen Bowens, I will not be voting in the vote. Is that thank you, Andy. James. Were you going to include the donation to the students at the school? I was going to get a separate motion okay. for those two. <laughs> <laughs> One at a time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, it's part of the list. I'm just yes. move it on the list now. Okay. Thank you. Are we ready for the question? All those in favor? Carried. Okay. And then the second motion would be for the three um, schools at $50 each um, to go out for next week to support um, the school activities. James and Ray. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Carried. 
and all would receive a letter included with that outlining that this is kind of the last um, under the old procedures. So um, for tonight, I'm not sure if you want to deal with some of the other um, straight donations that you've been asked for. If you want to leave those off till another night, that's fine too. And there's also just to add the 2015 fees waived pending that, that has to come back to council now that you have sort of a policy to consider. Um, so we're, if you would like, we can bring all of those back individually to remind you what they were. Um, or you can make decisions tonight, I guess, to read them yourself. So just point out where they are in here, Pat. So they're on that page. Page two at the bottom are the 2015 fee waived um, pending. Mm -hmm. I would like to defer the fees waived and the rest of the donations until till the next uh, council meeting. Okay. Right. Okay. That's good. <clears throat> so, are we ready to go to the next point, uh, two, by Greenway Trail report, Pat? Yeah. Um, I hope um, the council has <coughs> to take on um, uh, sort of the, the task of trying to um, clarify our lease with Dell Management to understand um, the role of the Blythe Greenway Trail if, with respect to the G to G Rail Trail. I'm hoping that my report here that I presented has provided enough background information. We had um, an on-site meeting with the Dell Management rep. The biggest challenge inside our lease was that the map that was attached, which was called Schedule A, was very, I'll say it was impossible to read it. it. You couldn't make it out. So it was very difficult to determine our east and west boundaries. And it, at the time, it didn't matter because nobody else was doing anything on either side of our lease. But with the potential of a, another group leasing uh, space for whatever purpose, uh, we wanted to clarify the east and west boundaries. So you'll see on page three of the report or the additional mapping of the report, we are clarifying with Dell Management that our west boundary is, if you know the area, where the trail meets with the Blythe Campground uh, laneway and intersects, and that our eastern point would be, it's sort of a, it's a GPS uh, spot, but it is on the far side, just slightly on the other side of the railway bridge or the arch, as people refer to it. And this has always been mapped out and traditionally been the Blythe Greenway Trail. It is part of the trail that we maintain and uh, that we travel often to ensure and our, and our members of the trail committee are committed to maintaining. So uh, Dell Management has um, agreed that these are our new endpoints. Not, they're not our new endpoints. We haven't really changed the lease. We've clarified the endpoints. So they're looking for council to confirm that those are our endpoints, and that we can now um, include this map inside our file for clarity, um, and that in future lease agreements, this would become the new Schedule A, and our lease is uh, due to renew in March 2016. Just to point out one other piece of it, I think it was March, or was it April 1st? Yes. March. The end of March. End of March. And, and so the other thing, just to point out for clarity, um, in the renewal, Dell Management will be including um, a provision that should Huron County take on the lease of the entire rail trail, that our lease will uh, defer to Huron County, and we will no longer hold the lease for what we consider the Blythe Greenwood Trail. Um, that's when that actually happens, and it will not, as far as I understand, happen before March 2016. They're not, not close in getting that done yet. And um, then what would happen is Huron County would hold the whole lease. And then as a municipality, we would work with Huron County to determine who will be the stewards of what we call the Blythe Greenway Trail. Will it continue to be managed exactly as it is? Would we have a sublease with them? Would they allocate who would be liable? We would work that out with Huron County at that time. 
but they're not there yet. So really it's status quo, same as always. We will continue to maintain the Blythe Greenway Trail. Today we just um, clarified the boundary points. That answers up. the questions that have been brought up a few times at council here. Bill. Uh, to be honest, that I'm, I'm a little unsettled with uh, us agreeing with boundary points or where they are. I would rather have seen the boundary points be the actual uh, boundaries of North Huron so that we maintain some semblance of control over those parts of the trail down the road uh, that are within North Huron's boundaries. Whereas this leaves us open to if they end up with some other kind of monkey agreement later on that, that we now have. Huron County having part of that trail in North here under their control, and part of it's under our control, and we've got bits and pieces on each one. I would rather see the endpoints be designated as the North Huron municipal boundary. So the trail from where it enters to where it exits in the west. But I, I couldn't really support that recommendation simply because um, to the west, the boundary would be to Blythe Road and it is not passable by pedestrians it is not an area of the trail that i would consider accessible and then north huron once uh, if we chose to lease that and it would be leased for trail you can't lease it and just leave it you have to lease it for the trail we would be involved in not a lot of expense in order to improve that trail in order to make it accessible and then you're landing at the top of a busy road instead Ours at the west ends at the Blythe Campground Road, and you can turn and take that road into Blythe if you want to go and have lunch, or do a loop back in, in through the town. So it kind of is a bad point to end on to the west of the North Road boundaries. To the east, it's a very small difference between where that trail is and where the actual boundary is, I believe it and i would have to check but we're not maintaining that portion now and so now we're going to have added expense added liability when we are simply asking that we can maintain the part that we always have and we call the black greenwood trail we've installed signage at each end of the trail to indicate you've now left the black Green, greenway trail and this trail is not maintained beyond this point for clarity okay. i don't see any reason why we couldn't continue over the next year to just leave them. Because if they do take it over, then they're going to have to fix that. But I mean, right now, I just seem to see us protect ourselves uh, with having a piecemeal operation between now and 2016 or 2017 when the other lease comes. Um, so I, as far as there, there is a um, some there is a bit of a right of way issue that's kind of brought to my attention anyway, the east end of the trail that we'll have to look at, but that's something that will have to be addressed separately. But uh, I I just want to know, I don't really see it having that kind of an impact on its financial. I don't think we would have to improve the trail at this point in time, but we would at least have control to maintain the signage saying it's an unmaintained portion. They're not going to force us to, to improve it, are they? Trevor. So that's a good question. If they, it, would, would they require us if that boundary was changed to that west end? Would, would there be a requirement from somebody to change that to an active trail? Okay, that's a good question. The lease we have now with Dell Management is for the Blythe Greenway Trail. The boundaries which we have identified have always been the boundaries of Black Greenway Trail. They've only been further clarified by this mapping. If we would like to extend what we've always called the Black Greenway Trail, we would have to enter into a new or revised lease with Dell Management, and that would be a different process than what I'm suggesting we do at this stage, which is to accept that this is the current mapping of our Black Green Tra Greenway Trail lease. There's a number of documents in the file that is trying to explain the definitions of the east and western boundary. But if you look back historically at what is the Blythe Greenway Trail, it is the trail that we have defined in this new mapping and identified with GPS coordinates. At one point, it stated in the document that it went all the way to elevator line. 
That was not an official document inside our lease. That was just a document used by Dell Management as the closest road to identify where that lease was near. So what we're asking today is to insert this map into the Dell Management file to clarify the endpoints of our lease. If we would like to extend our lease or expand our responsibility on that trail, that would be, a, I would think, a conversation to have in March 2016 when we renew the lease. Trevor, so so I would I would agree I would agree with that assessment. My only and I think Councillor um, Knox's concern is even with the signage and the specific designated endpoints of the trail, what is the risk mitigation that we have after those designated parts? Because that mm -hmm. section is still within the municipality. So what is our mitigation there? Even though that land is in the municipality, it is not owned by the municipality, nor is it leased by the municipality. So therefore, our risk management is not required. If we lease it, now we are required to be responsible for it. Any land that we don't own or operate inside North Huron is not our responsibility. So even though the trail, the land goes beyond our border, it's not leased by us. James, but we still hardly are involved here. If somebody gets hurt on that trail and the landowner does not have insurance to cover that, that will back balance back onto the municipality to help cover the liability insurance on that piece of property. Uh, I would probably <coughs> argue that it would actually bounce back on the province. The province owns that land. And they are the ones that are leasing it out to us or to anyone else along the Greenway Trail or the G to G Trail or Rail Trail. So really, when we toured it with our representative, she pointed out a few features on our on our leased portion that required maintenance that we are required to do because that maintenance is required inside our lease. But beyond the edge of our lease is not our responsibility. It is owned by the province. I hope that, yeah, it's sure. complicated. Mm -hmm. I'm tired. Yeah. So this, um, this new mapping is going to be registered in the file. Yes. Um, with the intent that when the lease is renewed in 2016, that that would form the new boundary if there isn't some other lease arrangement that occurs at that time. So this doesn't actually change the boundaries within the lease. Is that correct? We are, we are still leasing beyond this. This just identifies that that's what our maintained portion is. No, we were never leasing beyond this. It was just unclear in the Schedule A where that line was. So that's what we met on site to say, where is this in? And uh, so we have identified those and we are stating um, that this is the end of our, of our leased portion. And this new map will be Schedule A. There's no change to our lease. It is not a new lease or a new boundary. It's clarified by this map. Wait, so okay, what do you need, okay. what do you need here? You just need a motion to say do you need a motion? I do, and it's it's in the agenda. Um, yeah. that I need to confirm that the new map provided to identify the east and west boundaries of the Greenway Trail system, and that this map can be added to the Dell Management Property File and will be incorporated as the new Schedule A in any future lease agreement for the Blythe Greenway Trail, and further that this report on the status of the Blythe Greenway Trail lease be accepted for information purposes. In March of 2016, should Council want to designate a bigger trail or a smaller trail, the lease is up for renewal. We can draw a new mapping at that time. But at this point, we're just trying to clarify the endpoints of what we consider our trail. So we can put up a sign definitively, we've left our trail, you're on your own. I'll make that a motion. I'm not supportive of the extent of the trail at all, past these points. Mm -hmm. um, Discussion. Mm -hmm. This is your second one. Okay, uh, more discussion. Well, uh, there's another point in here that I want to bring up is the province considering future cost requiring engineering inspection report on the bridge. 
Are they referring to the Snowmobile Bridge because that's not our bridge? That's Snowmobile Club Bridge. So is that what they're talking about? They're actually referring to the entire arch bridge structure, which is inside our lease. Okay. <clears throat> to clarify, the arch bridge is actually a piece over the, at the north side of that. That's what actually is technically the arch or referred to as the arch bridge in the store. Two that brought this in here. So the lease, um, if you look at the property line, um, we've identified the end, the uh, so you're talking about the east end, right? Yeah. So although we talk about the trail and we have a little trail that goes through, we lease from the property line to the property line. And in that case, the property line is the part that goes where the snowmobilers go over, as well as the part through up and down. And then at the very sort of almost bottom of that hill, just beyond that bridge, is is the end of this lease agreement. <coughs> And that is a, a, um, a concerning part about the new engineering structure requirement. It is not in our lease right now, but uh, that so would be something definitely to negotiate moving forward in the new lease. That property does not belong to Dell or to the province. That piece of property belongs to North Huron. That was purchased by North Huron from the Grand Trunk Railroad. Okay. So the property running under the bridge. Okay. Is their right of way, but the bridge itself and that piece of property that it's on it actually belongs to North Europe. Uh, that's not what the mapping shows. I think we better get some clarification on the mapping because that was pointed out to me when we got into a discussion five years ago with regard to that. I was told by no uncertain truth by Ralph Kim that that in fact was our property going on that north south piece that runs from the back of, of uh, the whatever you want to call the service station portion there heading north up to the Morris Turner property line on the north side of the creek but that's actually our property. I can provide further detail on that. I know that when we were working with the snowmobile club to re repair that bridge I received documentation from Dell management to clarify that that is indeed inside our lease. But I can I don't I it's in this file somewhere and I'm more than happy to find it and produce that uh, for council in a future report. Also in clarification from back in 95 when the snowmobile club was, uh, wanted a rope to be able to get off the public road system and to be able to enter by uh, to get to get their fuel and, and uh, place to eat uh, that my understanding was that the fuzzy map is, is actually what was signed in 95 and that we have continued to lease that and that unless we change that lease that lease will be in effect Till March 31st next year. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure I, I followed um, what you're clarifying. These uh, GIS points at the ends of the Greenway Trail, uh, that unless we are trying to get out of part of the lease that we currently have, that these points would come into effect on negotiating a new lease. It's my understanding from speaking to Dell Management that the new map will be defined as the endpoints and that the old map is unreadable for us to define the end pieces and that's why we've gone through this process. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can read the old map, then you're better than me because it doesn't, it's not clear where the ends are. And that's really what started this whole conversation. Trevor. You know, with, with any agreement, it needs to be clear. And if this clear, clearly defines what the points are, then when March 31st, 2016 comes, it can become a form of a basis to, to negotiate is this the term? Is this the place? Is this the starting point? Is this the ending point? Right now, it's just clarity because if nobody has any clarity now, this is the clarity. Yes. 
So like, I think we use this as the clarity part, like that the staff is requesting. And you know, if somebody wants to come back on us and say, well, that's not a part of the original agreement, well, we've talked with the management group of the original agreement, so they're not clear. So <coughs> if the people who are managing the lease aren't clear, and the people who have the lease aren't clear, it's best to get something on in, in the file that says here what it, it is. So I support the, this. Obviously, we have some issues going forward with potentially when the new lease comes up. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about that when the new lease agreement comes up and focus on what the actual request is. And that's just the clarity part <coughs> of in what it is. Okay. Um, the thing of it is, the snowmobile clubs wanted it from road to road so they would have access points without trespassing. And that was why it was uh, elevator line and County Road 25 in the original in 95. That's all I'm going to say right now. Uh, and the motion is the, the Council of the Township North here and hereby confirms that the new map provided identifies the east and west boundaries of the Blythe Greenway Trail System, and that this map can be added to the Dell Management Property File and will be incorporated as the new Schedule A in any further lease agreement for the Blythe Greenway Trail. And further, that this report on the status of the Blythe Greenway Trail lease be accepted for information purposes. Any further? All in favor? Carried. Department update. Um, is there any questions on the point three the department update as written? Do I have a motion for that report then? Trevor and Yolanda. Any discussion? Bill. The question uh, to yourself, Pat, uh, can you fix the roof that leaking again? Yes. So um, the roof was repaired on Thursday, and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it rained and nothing came in. So, yes, we figured out what the challenge was. The new roof, the roofers, and the roof consultants were on site, and all of that has been torn up and redone, and uh, at the expense of the roofer. And uh, the repairs to the inside of the building, we are to build to the roofer as well. So there's no additional expense to jump to the here. Trevor. Um, the only thing I question, and I can't remember if we have further on, is the conversation about the Belgrave office building. Is this further on? Okay. Yeah. Carry on. All in favor? Carry on. Utility department. Is there any questions or comments? <coughs> yes, yeah, so I guess the, the first uh, item on 6.4.3 is the uh, bar solids removal um, selection. Um, uh, I won't bring any questions if there's anything on the uh, staff report there. Um, like I said, it was a really a combination of, of uh, price and methodology on the uh, on the selection of the, the contractor. Any, any of them, uh, I would have confidence in any of them. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I think they had the best method to remove it from the uh, from the lagoon um, and the, the least cost to haul it. And uh, they were going to. Actually, inject it in the soil, which has some some bonuses too. So. <coughs> uh, 
the suggested motion is the council the township of north here hereby accepts and approves the proposal from bioag services inc to remove 3500 cubic meters of biosolids at the William uh, sewage treatment plant a cost of $44,625 plus GST to add a mover. Ray, Bill, question? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Um, Don, does, does, our, does our budget, maybe you and Donna, do yourself read, does our budget have enough, I guess, flexibility to have an $8,000 overage in one, in one budget line item to affect like are, can we absorb that in our budget somewhere? There, there is other projects that we will have to take a serious look at. Like my full intention is to come in on the budget. So it is an eight thousand dollar overage. Uh, when I called, I didn't uh, like eight eight fifty. I believe the last time we called, I was extrapolating that to ten dollars, and that was not enough. No, and, and it's a little different method to it. Um, it's a little more costly the way they're going to do it, but it's going to be a better job in the day. So, so no, I have full intentions of meeting my budget. Okay, no, thank you. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Okay, and the accreditation authority selection. Uh, yeah, again, this was, uh, we have had one firm um, gave us quotes, the, the ones that have, uh, we've been with uh, since you know, Canadian General Standards uh, Board uh, initiated the whole, whole thing. Um, we have no uh, no issues with the quality of work or anything else, but the uh, pricing came back. That it would be just more beneficial for us to uh, to go with them. Um, I've been uh, there's in talking with them. It, it is a, shouldn't be too much administration for us to do the switch. And that was uh, one of the main concerns we had on on saving a thousand dollars if we were going to spend a uh, week uh, fiddling with paperwork with them, but. Um, I, they said it's very straightforward and it's just a straight transfer. They notify the former uh, accreditation authority, they transfer the uh, certificate to them and then they just take over from there. So, and it's going to be the same schedule as on the audits as the former. So, um, I, I see no reason why we would not switch. Okay. There's the suggested motion that the Council of the Township of North here and hereby approves uh, retaining NSF to the provision of accreditation for the next three years at the total estimated cost of 7170 for the period. Light them over. Uh, Bill and Jim. All in favor? Carried. And the third point uh, the sanitary sewer service line replacement application and agreement. The suggested uh, motion is that the Council of the Township of North here hereby approves the use of the application slash agreement form titled North Huron Sewer Service Replacement Application, May 2015. Drive them over. Bill? And Yolanda? Uh, discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thanks. Okay. And part four uh, the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby accepts the June 10th, 2015 report of the Chief Operator as presented. Do I remove her? And Yolanda? Any questions? All in favor? Karen. Sorry, Neil. I just have oh, sorry. one little, little tiny update. Okay, so we 
finally got the radio nuclide uh, results back in an assessment from Ministry of Labor as well as Ministry of the Environment. And uh, the, the radio nuclides are, are elevated, uh, but they're below the limit. So, so we're good to go. So I just want to pass that on. It's been a long time. Um, okay. Anyone else? Uh, moving to the finance department. And the suggested motion that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby accept the June 10th, 2015 report of the Director of Finance for information purposes. Uh, Trevor? For discussion. And seconder? Bill? Uh, discussion, Trevor? Yeah. Can you clarify, Donna, what these tax arrear certificates, what this process is, please? Yeah. Um, so once a property re reaches three full years of current tax or of current tax mm -hmm. arrears plus the current year, so they would owe what has been come due in 15, but they would also have full years of 14, 13, and 12. So once that time has met, then um, we, we send the monthly reminders and we go through registered mail and all that sort of thing. So for in dealing with the um, period ending December 31st, 2014, um, if there's still the three years of full arrears, then we are entitled to register. Step one is registering of a tax arrear certificate against the property, and then that is a, kind of the first step in the tax sale process. So from the time that the property is registered, there's a one-year period in which the owner has the opportunity to pay off the whole amount owing. If up until the date of June 22nd, they had the option to pay all the penalty and interest owing and the third year to remove them out of that third year situation. But once you um, get the tax order certificate registered, then you either have to make suitable arrangements by signing an agreement or pay the whole month sum to avoid the tax sale. So, what, when you say tax sale, if you haven't paid by the end of the one year period, we would actually put the property up for sale. That's what I want to understand. Yeah. And you see those ads in the paper periodically from other municipalities that that's what they mean. And when you say a number of properties, is it less than 10? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, just, uh, real quick, we're on the housing agreement, by the way, is there a target date for that yet? Uh, when we think they'll have that ready to go? And, and that relates back to the uh, street fest we originally said that was going to be about mid July starting. Right. So that bylaw is, is in the bylaw section, actually, of the um, um, package tonight. Yeah, I'm just construction dates more, I guess, back over there. Well, we're still starting, working. we're still working at mid July. We just started the structures today. So, the structures we've got. Are we talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, I guess the only thing was that we just uh, the BIA and requested to. There's, just, there's not going to be any disruption to the traffic because we're. Well, which, which way did we reach the traffic in the close? East or west side? I don't know. We'll probably go to the opposite side of where we're working right now. No, no, yeah, we're, we're going to the section we will be doing is from the creek just to the edge of Westmoreland through through the the west side of, uh, of the housing property. Basically, if you line up the chain link fence and those little cedars there, that's roughly the line that we'll be going and we'll be terminating at Westmoreland. So the road itself actually won't be closed. No. Oh, okay, that's. Let's get back to the motion yep. that we're working on. Yep. Trevor? And the only thing, other comment I would have is I, I would, I'm really excited to see what uh, staff is going to come back with with these water adjustments. I think the administration part of this is, is frankly, disgusting. <laughs> and I think it better 
a better way to, <coughs> to administer that program might be is definitely more likely. So. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Carry. <coughs> Uh, we are to date budget report for uh, the fire department, the finance department. So I've actually reviewed the report um, since you have it because I've actually run another year end close. So the only um, item that wouldn't be in your in the new one that I'm looking at, um, which would be in the one you're looking at, is still showing depreciation that's carried over from 2014. But in the new run, it's not there. So everything else is the same. So um, please go through it. If you have any questions, email me, or I can um, give you a quick call, whatever you like, in order to um, go through if you have any questions. There's nothing at this point really that's um, of, um, significantly out of whack. Everything appears to be um, basically on target. We don't run a 112 budget, of course, so our, our um, expenses are not typically 112 following the calendar year. They're based on seasonal um, employees and that type of thing. But um, anyway, as I said, if you have any questions, please give me a show. Sure. Okay, uh, 6.4.5 Fire Department uh, uh, North Term is the department update. Uh, any questions or comments? I think the report's pretty self explanatory. Under Noble, uh, uh, obviously, South Bruce and Long Term have approved the automatic aid agreements for everybody. Uh, anecdotally, uh, a lot of people commenting the number of uh, grass and open air burn fires we had this year. The answer is yes, we're up slightly, but not as much as we think. But the bigger difference is, is when we had fields on fire, there was a lot of stuff burning. And uh, uh, the significance of that is, is that our hours for April and May were 50% uh, higher than we were projected for those two months. And those hours are all triggered back to uh, large open air burns to get out of control. Okay, the suggested motion that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby accept fire department of North Huron report for the month of May 2015. Uh, Ray and Jim, any uh, comments? All in favor? Carry. <coughs> Thanks, David. Nothing uh, unfinished business. Moving to 8.1, Wingham and District Hospital Foundation fundraiser. Anybody want to talk on that? Just, Donna? Well, just a comment. As we've talked about uh, for part of our fiscal review, one of the places that the staff that we feel that um, we really have to take a close look at is all these requests for donations that come in and um, we realize that all the volunteers and all these community organizations do terrific work in and around our community for sure but it is an area i think there's three more new three requests in here again tonight so it's definitely something that we need to have a process set up on and uh, determine how much money council feels that they can add to the tax levy by supporting all these groups in the community. So, secondly, um, something that we're looking forward to having a policy and procedures nailed down. But I guess really what we were looking for is some sort of initial re reaction from council as to, you know, um, for donations at one time. Council is really moving away from donations altogether, and then now we seem to have come back around. And, and <coughs> this council, the last few years, been very generous with with um, um, so uh, taking on all kinds of requests. Yes, exactly. So, anyway, that's just a comment. Bill, uh, this particular one, I don't really see. Is there a cost attached to this? Uh, and I guess this maybe is the path of it. We're just asking for use in public spaces. Uh, 
Um, we do have a public space in the park rental fee. Um, it's not clear in this letter whether they are going to use a space and exclusively set it up, use it, and not allow the public. Or are they just running through the park? Um, in the past, they actually did use the um, area outside of the complex and set up an obstacle course and all of that. That would be a rental fee traditionally. So it's not clear here in this letter, other than just they want to use the public spaces, whether they are specifying specifically what they need. They haven't been in contact with us. So perhaps if council would like, I could try and follow up and get an understanding of what they're asking for. They just are here using the parks. And in the past, we've waived that fee of use of the park if they needed to set stuff up. So I guess we need a clarification if that's what they want, an exclusive use of an area, then it will get deferred. Mm -hmm. So we can just defer it. Uh, okay. Uh, that's deferred then. Uh, 8.2 uh, care partners and that have been tenants of 14 King Street Belvery. Oh, uh, we're to do a deferral motion. Uh, Ray and Bill, all in favor? Carry. Okay. Now we go to 14 Queen Street Belgrade. And that is that. Yeah, so um, these, uh, this group has been a long time tenant of our building. And they provided official notice on April 14th um, that they would be vacating. Um, they are now moved out. They gave us a date um, of mid-June. So in our um, tenant lease, it requires three months notice, which would be May, June, and July. And they have paid us up to the end of June. So they're asking for forgiveness of the month of July. And they are out of the building now. And I, I'm, it's really up to council. There's there's no reason not to, I guess, be forgiving for the third month, but that's um, up to council. They aren't there now, and it's our building to do what we wish. Cool. Uh, when did the actual lease expire? So the actual date of the expiry of the lease was May 2014, and we have been working with them to negotiate their future in that building before we did repairs. And so that is another, it's just been rolling over month to month, waiting for us to clarify what their future in that building was. So that's another sort of piece of the puzzle that um, I guess speaks to their, their request. Trevor? So if their original lease ended, yeah. Do we have something signed by the tenant that's turned into a month to month that would follow the same constitutions of the lease? Because if it if we don't, then to me we don't have a leg to stand on to ask for a third month because that lease is expired. So do we have do we have anything in, in writing? Yep. <clears throat> so just Okay. I think I think it's been an ongoing discussion for over a year with this group as to what their intent was, where they were going. A lot of that was private conversation <coughs> that could not be talked about in, in public because they're a private organization. We hadn't discussed with their employees or their clients if they were making a change. So we didn't sign anything with them. But it's really up to council uh, what we would like to do about the month of July. Bill? I hate to do it, but I, I think under the circumstances that we legally give them and give us 30 days notice. So I think that uh, I would be willing to make a motion that we accept uh, uh, under the circumstances we accept the two months notice and uh, call it. Do we have a seconder? Students? Any more discussion? Trevor? The only discussion I would have is that if we get into a circumstance in the next uh, again, that we are very clear with when the termination ends that we get something to designate what our legal rights are under a new arrangement. So, 
All in favor of the motion? Carry. And uh, Karen County Crime Stoppers. <coughs> oh, do you want to? No. Um, you held your hand up. I did. I was waving my head. I did. I was in my hand. This is not my item. No, this is not my item. Motion to defer. Do I have a second? Any discussion? All in favor? Gary. Okay. And keep Hydro public privatization of Hydro One. Suggested motion goes that the Council of the Town of North Turn hereby will kept of the rest of the wording. And council thoughts on whether we have an appetite to dig into that debate. I'll stick my I'll support the request. Make a motion with the resolution. To be attached resolution. Yeah. To be attached. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Wait. Any discussion? Trevor. The only discussion or the only comment I would have is their arguments have they been proven? Like I know it's it's an argument, so I would I'm, I'm just <coughs> conscious that the fact is of why the province is doing what they're doing. But nobody has at least for me, nobody has explained to me how these things would cause increases or not be in decreases. So I guess I'm just, I'm more cautious of, of the fact that, you know what, I, I like status quo or people like status quo and that's why they, they want this, but I just, I struggle with the, we really don't know if their concerns are valid or not. So, that that's all my my comment that I have to say. Okay. Anybody else? All in favor? Carry. Okay. <coughs> 8.5 Belgrade Summer Festival 2015 uh, Committee of the Belgrade Community Center Board. Um, in that request, I'm not sure how good uh, some of my basswood trees are, that if we were deferring that to another meeting i may have what they would need for the carving trees Pat? um i did follow up with um and i think uh connie has talked to the organizer as well but i did follow up with the belgrade community center board to really understand a little bit about the event so the event is um a subcommittee of the belgrade community center board which is um, their own it's their own event and um, I guess the number two which is the request to place banner advertising um, on top of the hill is really something that needs to go to uh, assign our sign bylaw um, and just be discussed with um, Tim Lewis and I, I don't know whether they they were directed to do that I don't know whether they have but I think they just need to follow that bylaw under that number two request I'm not sure whether that's something that that's without his input. Uh, that also 
in relation to the county because yeah. it's county road. So they really need to go. That piece of yeah. it, I think, needs to not be considered by this North Carolina Council at this time. I think it would have to be um, either directed for input from Tim Lewis or County Roads Department. County Roads or, but are they? But it's really, I, I think, up to this group to, to further investigate that and, and, and come back with what the request is. They haven't even mapped it out really for us. It's what their location for that banner is. And sorry, I was just going to add mm -hmm. with respect to the first one, that is a road closure. And um, it, it would have minimal impact because they're asking to close it from the highway to sort of the first home. And people have access via the other entrance uh, south of that. So I would suggest that maybe each of these could be handled independent, each request on their own as far as the council. That's my two cents. <laughs> Of that too, they, they have to notify the emergency. Yes. The fire, the fire. Yeah, that's their, their big, yeah. Kathy can explain how they do it. If we close the road, then we take care of um, notifying all the EMS. Okay. Sure. Do you want to just deal with the road closure issue this evening and then address staff to provide clarification on the rest? Okay. Yes. Driver, I'll make a motion to support the road for you. And Bill seconds. All in favor? Carry. Um, so for the other points, we would have a borough motion. Oh, Kathy can just yeah, say all in favor of including it in that motion. Okay, good. Okay. Big Brothers, Big Sisters of North Huron uh, Charity Golf Tournament. Trevor? Any motion to defer? Do I have a seconder? Bill? Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Okay, council information. Uh, you may bring any of those points. Uh, forward for further discussion if you want. Right. I guess it's the Connie. It would be not Connie, but uh Towns in Um, basically, the 9.1, I'm not sure uh, whether some of the other uh, council members uh, filled out the profile. Uh, I thought that it was a great idea. And because of schedule, I didn't get to it. And today I read an email on uh, how it was profiling, how they could look 
to specific groups as to how to train people possibly to campaign in the next election and looking at trying to get certain groups represented on council that currently aren't. Um, um, I forget the exact wording, but it made me com comfortable in that I had <coughs> Question for that for the rest of the council. I'm the guy Because I spent over eight hours today reading information so that if I can find it. <clears throat> Motion to okay. I'll move my bill in the line of seconds. All there, Paul Trevor. Sorry, I just want to ask is, is there a council member going to the Lions Lions Club members? There will be somebody represented there. Oh, so I just want to make sure it's only going. That's that's all my point is. Uh, other than the first and the last one, I'll be going to them. Okay, okay, uh. Okay, correspondence. Trevor. Council, uh, motion to agree with correspondence we've ever read about. And you'll land a second. All in favor? Carry. Uh, there's committee reports. Uh, anything to add or any questions uh, on the blind arena advisory board? Live BIA. June 3rd uh, meeting minutes. Uh, William Town Hall Theater minutes of uh, April 23rd, May 21st. Just so long, we'll go back to the IPA. We are going to be our guests. Do they have everything from the county as in regards to putting those parkets in? I just to CAO. So they did discuss it at the last BIA meeting, and Tim Lewis attended on behalf of the municipality as well to discuss what the requirements would be. At this time, um, they are required to give an engineering report. Um, it basically assesses the integrity of the structure if it were to have a vehicle collision. And I don't believe that requirement has been met yet. And so um, they will be working with Tim to make sure that all of the requirements of the county and the chief building official are met before um, the park gates or park acts are allowed to be put out. As I understood, the county engineer was not ready to put any stamps on. That was allowed to do too. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's fine with uh, the question. Uh, bylaws 12.1, bylaw number 48, uh, 2015, being a bylaw to establish fees and charges uh, for the county trip of North Third. Uh, and uh, we introduced, read a first and second time. Mover and secondary, Bill and Yolanda. All in favor? Carry. And at uh, bylaw number 48, 2015, uh, 
be read a third and final time, uh, signed by the Raven Clerk and the Ghost in the bylaw book. Ray and Jim. All in favor? Ray. Uh, bylaw number 49. Legal bylaw to authorize the Raven Clerk to sign a grant of easement with House and House and Limited. And that uh, will be introduced. We had a first and second time. Over and seconder. Bill and Jim. All in favor? Carried. And uh, bylaw number 49. Uh, we read a third and final time signed by the reading clerk and engrossed in the bylaw book. Bill and Yolanda. All in favor? Carried. Uh, at the beginning of council reports and inquiries, Kathy told me that that surgery uh, went well and that she was talking so that uh, we all wish him a speedy return to health. Uh, okay, I'll let councillors talk about their reports and inquiries. Trevor? So I will give an update. Um, the Bridges community um, has new two co chairs, so, which I am very happy to hear. <laughs> so, um, Carrie Ann Cameron, Cameron and uh, Teresa Baker um, are, have taken on the, that responsibility. So, I will be back to my liaison responsibilities, which is nicely. Nicely fits into my schedule. Um, and I will say that uh, they are having an information session uh, Wednesday at 6 o'clock at the Element, uh, Maitland River for uh, the public uh, to ask questions, concerns, uh, where the project is at, what the phases are, all those types of things. It is going to be a 20 minute information session, and then uh, some ambassadors and <coughs> kids are going to take the Take everybody out to the to show the way the land and where things are going to be and, and how it looks. So um, obviously, uh, all those that can attend greatly. So um, I think that's all I have for tonight. Okay. Jim, it was great to represent the council and staff at the uh, Tim Hortons campaign. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that the amount of money that they have on their window that they raised for camp, have done anything, any of the Tim Hortons I've been at, they have done, they did very well. I know that uh, our CEO will have a different pair of shoes. <laughs> 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 they, they don't let me behind the counter with high heels. <laughs> <laughs> she says behind the counter with mobile, but there's nothing back there. Oh. But it was a lot of fun. Very good. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move forward to the CIO's report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the first report that I have before you tonight is the committee appointment uh, policy report. One of the uh, first things that I noticed in coming to North Karen is that we do have a tremendous amount of volunteers that are very interested in making their community a better place. And because of that, there are a number of committees that are operating, um, both as committees of council and just on an informal basis in the community. And so I was noticing that um, in many cases, with these committees, their roles have not been clearly defined. We don't necessarily have terms of reference in place for them. And uh, it can create some problems when there's a lack of communication around what the roles and responsibilities are of a, of a committee and also what the township's contribution to the committee's projects is going to be. So I felt there was a need for council to have a policy that they can consider um, putting some criteria in place when um, they're establishing committees for the township. 
Uh, the policy defines the types of committees that we have. A lot of committees that you're going to have are going to be of the ad hoc type where um, they're formed for a specific purpose, they're of short term duration, and they go away after their mandate's been fulfilled. You do have some committees that will be working with you ongoing in an advisory capacity, such as the airport committee. Um, and so it's important to define the roles of each of those. And I would recommend if council uh, approves this policy that we would do an assessment of all of the existing committees within the township and define them within this policy and start to work to develop terms of reference so that we're all clear on what our direction is. Uh, some of the things that I've been hearing early on, both from volunteers and from staff, is that they can be frustrated by the process um, or lack of, of process and clarity. And we certainly don't want to frustrate our volunteers. We want to make it easy and pleasurable for them to volunteer for the municipality. Um, and sometimes the role of the committee will evolve over time. So you can have dwindling membership and next thing you know, you've got more staff resources sitting at the table at a committee meeting and you do have volunteers coming out and it's time to reassess those roles as well. The policy recognizes that there are a couple of different ways that council appoint committees. Uh, you can appoint them at your own discretion. So you may have a, a particular project that you say, yeah, we want to uh, have some community engagement on this and uh, public input and let's establish a committee and you would go through a formal uh, process to recruit members to that committee and I've set that out in the policy. Oftentimes you are approached by groups that are already established and coming to you and saying we'd like to work on this project. Um, the Town Hall Theatre is an example of that where they're asking them to become a committee of council uh, to carry out that work. So I think it's important when council has those requests that they um, they apply this policy and say, okay, does this group uh, represent a mandate that we feel is important to the township? And if so, you could direct that back to staff to come back with a staff report talking about how much staff resource is it going to take to uh, facilitate that, this committee? Um, what are the financial implications of the project that this group wants to undertake? Um, it, it helps council to make some decisions as whether you want to make that a committee of council or not. Um, some groups just want to volunteer, and so maybe they don't want the formality of becoming a committee of council. One of the things that we need to make sure of when we're appointing a committee of council is that they meet certain requirements. They're going to be covered under the municipal insurance, um, acting on behalf of the municipality as a committee of council. And so there needs to be a reporting back on those activities to council. We need to get copies of their minutes. We need to get copies of their financial statements, budgets, um, because if there was ever a challenge or um, an insurance claim relating to the activities of that group, there's going to be a test as to whether they were a bona fide committee of council. And so we need to prove that they're reporting back to council in, in that regard. Um, so maybe there are some groups that just don't want to be that formal. For example, you know, a committee that wants to be out there and volunteering and digging in flower beds and that sort of thing. And so we don't need to make those groups a committee of council. They can act as volunteer groups that are at arm's length from the municipality. We have forms that they can fill out as volunteers of the municipality where they're covered by insurance if they're working on our property. But they can meet on their own without having staff attend their meetings and perhaps appoint a liaison that could just then uh, report to a relevant department head um to discuss what their wants are you know this is work that we need to have done in the park and by establishing clear lines of communication between those groups and staff uh, hopefully we can make the process a little more streamlined and less frustrating for everyone um, the policy does also talk about um, qualification of members and a lot of that would be spelled out in the terms of reference. 
Uh, the terms of reference really is a key document to outline the requirements uh, of each committee. What is your membership? What is your structure going to be? Um, how often do you meet? What are your meeting procedures? And what are the financial requirements? If you're going to be fundraising for a project like renovating the town hall, at what point can you spend money? What is the um, what are some of the requirements around fundraising? So you can really spell out um, all of the guidelines that a committee needs to follow in that terms of reference, and it's important to do before they start their work, so everyone knows. Um, there, under the qualifications, um, I should note that there was um, discussion and, and I gave some consideration about staff roles. And that's something that uh, you mentioned tonight, Jim, is that, um, you know, staff can really be drawn into these community activities and next thing you know, we're providing a lot of resources to a committee and it's adding additional costs to the municipality. So I think it's important that we spell out in the terms of reference uh, what the township is providing to these committees. And um, there is discussion about uh, whether staff can volunteer on committees. And I think that you know we don't want to encourage our staff from volunteering and being active members of our community. But at times, by virtue of their position, they can tend to be drawn in more. And next thing you know, on working hours, you know, they're they're giving resources of the township. So I think it's important that we monitor that. And um, so I've suggested that uh, if a staff member wants to volunteer on a committee, that they would have some discussion with the CAO to make sure that it's not going to conflict with township duties, and we would just monitor that. Um, and my final point would be on uh, special interest groups. So sometimes you may get a group approaching you that has a, a narrow focus on an issue and you want to lobby council to change your decision making on a particular issue. And they may want to request you to be a committee of council. And I'm really advising against that, that they can be a special interest group on their own and make recommendations to council through a, a delegation process. Um, but I think council has an obligation when they're looking at a big issue to look at all points of view and to make sure that um, they're doing a thorough investigation um, on a particular issue. So it would be my recommendation not to make special interest groups a committee of council. So that's the extent of my report. Comments? Uh, okay, maybe I'm sensitive to it, but on 5C, 1, and 2, um, I'd say is an excellent uh, report but just reading one 5c1 an evaluation of applications will be conducted by a staff review team consisting of the township clerk chief administrative officer and or relevant department head the results of this evaluation will be provided to council in a closed session and it's how full that uh, evaluation is given to us is what I'm saying because 5C2, council shall be responsible for the selection of preferred candidates in each meeting. And uh, that if we were only given the candidate selected, uh that might uh, it, we will have to have a full accounting of how the committee did it uh but by me if i'm overly sensitive but it could have council 
uh, responsible and that uh, if we don't have a full accounting, there is the possibility one out of a hundred times somebody might talk about it being a closed issue. Uh, the staff made a decision that council didn't have all the information. So that would be my caution. Other than that, you put together a tremendous paper. Yep. Would you like to just change the wording of the evaluation of the applicants will be conducted and uh, the results of all of the evaluations provided to council? And that will cover that. So they get review all the applicants and then give us all of their appraisals and then we pick from there. That will cover that situation. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, if you're responsible, and and as you say, um, you may be approached by you know if there were unsuccessful candidates, you may be approached. So um, you know, it wasn't the intent to exclude information, but more to assess the applications in accordance with the criteria and sort of make recommendations to council. But I can certainly provide some clarity around that. Um, in the draft that comes forward when council wishes to adopt it. Well, thank you very much for all the work you put into it because it's a very good document. That's the only thing that triggered with me. Yeah. Uh, we have a motion. Uh, okay. All in favor? Okay. Uh, uh, administrative activities update. Um, yes, the only thing I have to add is on your cross border policy. Um, I didn't bring it forward uh, because we had a response back from West Turnberry, and um, their initial response is positive, and they wish to have another meeting. And we've been trying to schedule that. So I'm waiting final confirmation, but it looks like it could be uh, the 22nd of June, that she's just waiting for confirmation from one of their parties. And uh, we might as well get that comment before we bring it back to the table. Okay. Uh, the report of the CAO 2015 Hyphen zero six hyphen zero two pertaining to administration activities is received for information. Yolanda and Ray, all in favor? Carry. Public gallery uh, questions or comments? Okay, good on Thank you. Quick here uh, in the policy for rent, uh, sorry, for waiting fees and donations, what qualifies as a community? Let's see if I got permission of that. That's a good question. It's in my notes, I think, but not in the policy. Um, really, it's, it's, I think it's in our, it's really in rates and fees. Really, any community <coughs> group is a group that operates inside the municipality as a not-for-profit venture, but, uh, We've always had a loose term, and it's pretty clear. If it's the Lions or minor hockey or the Hitman, that's a community group. If it's Libro Financial, that's a private rental. Sort of, or Buck and Go is a private rental, not a community group. I'm trying, so, to, I'm trying to remember if I have it defined somewhere in, in the rates and fees notes. Okay, so that will exclude then, say, Hullet in their request to school. It will also exclude the William Curley book. That's a donation request, not. Oh, no, no, I'm, oh. I'm not not the specific request, but just any like, you know, any group outside of the borders will not fall under that. That that that's what you're saying essentially. Well, if a school rents a facility, uh, a school board group rents a facility, they're typically given the community rate. Okay. Um, because they're res they are. Yeah, they're given the community rate. What was the other group you said? The uh, when you call it girl, uh, girl, yeah, call it girl. Right. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's right. this donation request, so I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Nice can, no, I think that was probably part of the policy was that it says in there generally that a community group that maybe contributes 
substantially to North Huron would be considered even for from outside the area. So that would be part of that. I know we can word that in there somewhere. Yeah, I think yes. that's in the donation part. Yeah, yeah so that's in the donation part. In the donation part. Oh, you could maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. It's just standard that anyone that's a not for profit slash community group slash not a private business is, is pretty much um, entitled to the community rate um, when we are renting our facilities. Private groups, private citizen rentals are given the private rate. I think he makes a fair point though, yeah. and we should probably define that within our fee bylaw um, to be clear on you know who gets assessed the rate. So thank you. I think that's a good point. I just have one other question about the, uh, the committee policy. Um, just kind of a, something that came to mind here was would the Wingham Heritage Theater Committee not have been deemed a special interest group under, under that definition? As council had decided to close the theater and then they came forward and suggested you reopen it? It's that fine line between an ad hoc committee wanting to do something over a period of time and then just hand it off. So that, it, like, it's pretty close to the same uh, thing uh, at the end of the day. So, special interest or ad hoc, they could be fairly close, whichever way it goes. Miranda? I mean, if you get 50, it's not heritage. It's the living theater. Sure, you're right. That, that was the form of my mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. And I think, too, when when they approached, um, you know, council essentially said that um, if you can be successful in fundraising to make this project happen, then we would support the project when it can occur. So. It's, it's essentially to work on a capital project that council has determined they are going to support and move forward with, uh, pending that they achieve their fundraising goals. Uh, yeah, just, just to further add to that, I think initially that group worked on their own for almost a year as a special interest group where they were not receiving any staff or council support. Once they became a motion to, as um, CEO explained, then they became a committee of council once they were given <coughs> permission to fundraise and, and work towards improvements of the building. But they really transitioned in, from one to the next once they had uh, presented their case to council and council approved their interest, I guess I would say. Sort of all saying the same thing. Here we I just have one thing um, to present, kind of exciting. Um, during the Muskrat Festival weekend, or on the weekend, uh, um, MPP Thompson stopped by and uh, presented Maddie, actually because Maddie the Muskrat was on site at that time, with a, um, a congratulatory certificate for their 10th anniversary. So just a kind of a good news thing. It's kind of fun. So. Okay. Any others in the gallery have questions or comments? How much difference in the community rate and the public rate? It would vary a bit, would it not? Uh, it varies on the facility and the, um, uh, yeah, it varies. Do we get a community rate then? This week. When you guys rent the facilities from us, yes. That's the community rate. Okay, okay uh, nothing more from the gallery, uh, so uh, we have an in-camera session, and that is a proposed retaining acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality and local board, and litigation or potential litigation involving matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board.